Okay, hello there. Welcome to the Family History Foundation. And we today, of course, are going to be talking about coats of arms and surnames. Can I use a coat of arms that I see online or somewhere for my surname? Can I use it for me? And of course, the answer is both yes and no. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> so I'm going to cover all of this in great detail for you. Um, and so you are going to understand what's going on here because uh, am I allowed to use a coat of arms for my particular surname? That is the million dollar question to which the answer is both yes and no. So follow me on this and I will sort of elucidate everything for you. And I will cover the do's and don'ts of using a coat of arms for your surname, for your family name, and also cover the use of related terms such as family crests, heraldry, livery, the college of arms, and the like. So this is what the table of contents looks like for this article and it's a very very lengthy in-depth sort of highly conclusive article and I'm not actually gonna cover it the whole thing in this video just because it's just super super informative and meaty and you know we don't want to spend the whole time just talking on it I'm gonna take you through the first section uh, and the beginning of this section and jump down to the conclusion and you guys can come over here and read the rest at your own leisure because there's so much to kind of cover but trust me by the time uh, you get through this you will really have the most in-depth understanding of coats of arms and surnames because this whole article has been researched by a historian and someone who has used uh, references that are in-depth and accurate so you can jump to the references section and that's always a good sign of scholarly work when you have a references section that actually lists uh, the the sort of things that I've taken the information from and synthesized all of that together so the short answer coats of arms in modern times the short answer to the question am I allowed to use a coat of arms for my surname is as I mentioned again both yes and no and uh, following it's just kind of an outlay the lay of the land so to speak I will give brief answers to the question in this section right telling you why yes and no and then give you all the reasons why in the form of a long-winded <laughs> but super cool history lesson in the next section which covers everything in super super high resolution detail so uh, off the bat no <clears throat> okay no 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 you are not allowed to use a registered coat of arms if you have not been formally granted permission to do so by the College of Arms okay so unless you have that in writing and you have legal permission to do so no okay that's the short answer um, and please always remember this phrase right here arms are granted to individuals not families okay arms are granted to individuals not families all right it's an award basically so just because your father got an award doesn't mean that you get this, the right to that award right or your third great grandfather had an award uh, doesn't mean you have the right to claim that award as yours not always the case with coats of arms sometimes not always okay so a coat of arms is passed down like a family heirloom within a geneocentric family that means a family that is related by blood or right genealogy genes just because your last name and I kind of you know this is kind of sort of expanding it out but just because your last name is Jones a very common name doesn't give you permission to walk into AT&T Stadium for free anytime you want to watch a football game okay um, talking about Jerry's world obviously but again you know Jones is a very common surname if your ha last name happens to be Jones doesn't mean you can't claim show up to uh, the Jones house and have family dinners right um, neither does it give you the right to claim half the land in Wales for that matter being one of the most common Welsh surnames and below you see uh, this coat of arms for the Jones family right so if you're into genealogy and your last name is Jones and you see this you're like oh my gosh this is like represents my family right well that's the legal no but now let's get into the yes okay let's get into why maybe you can 
okay? And what you see here are called uh, novelty coats of arms, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into a very sort of in-depth explanation as to where they come from. Uh, this is a, an example taken from Etsy, right? It's a, some seller has pieced, to get, pieced this together, is now selling this, right? If this were an actual coat of arms, you wouldn't be selling this to uh, peep anybody, whether your last name is Jones or not, for purchase, right? And you can see the watermark there because it's obviously sort of like they're protecting this as they created it. And I'm going to go into the whole uh, sort of looking at how coats of arms are created. There are certain sections requisite sections that exist within coats of arms right like these mantles and you can see these banners down here and the where the head goes and right there's a lot of different set elements to it um, which of course if you go back up to the right right up here you can see these sort of parts on uh, I've named them the crest mantling helmet I'm not me naming them that's the, actually their names but so let's kind of get into this so but yes 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 the yes part is you can use a novelty coat of arms for fun. Yes, indeed, right? And here's what I call the real deal, right? Coats of arms are <clears throat> such captivating and mesmerizing works of art. They really are works of art uh, with their accompanying bold imagery that we are naturally inclined to want to be a part of them in some way, especially when we see family crests or coat of arms with our surname on it. I mean, we really get drawn to it and kind of charged up by it, right? There's a good energy like, looking at it, like, wow. Okay, so, and, and the market for those things arose alongside the increasing demand for online genealogical research where people are going on Ancestry and other sites and looking up their family histories. And then you see these coats of arms appear and you're like, whoa, like, is it mine? Right, and it was created to heighten what I call family history fancy, right? Uh, but what I'm saying, uh, and really honestly, if a design looks cool and has your surname on it, and you want to use it for fun, and go ahead and use it. I really, I don't have any problem with it. I think it's really cool because it draws us into our family history. And you know, you want to connect with your heritage back to medieval times in Europe and all those sorts of really cool, neat things. I, I say 100% go for it, okay? As long as you know that it's actually not literally yours is granted by the code, uh, the College of Arms, okay? So that's kind of the yes part of it, okay? And it's the fun part of it. So, you know, enjoy that part. Now, the second part of this article has to do with the long answer, a history of coats of arms and heraldry. So the rest of this article really takes you through an in-depth history of the development of coats of arms, like where they came from, how they originated, and how really they sort of spun out of the knightly class and uh, the romanticism and practicality of, of battle warfare really um, to distinguish one warrior from another on whose side they were and stuff. So that's kind of the sort of gritty, nitty gritty of how the uh, coats of arms originated. And so I'm gonna just take you quickly through a few of the sections and of course I would encourage you to come back and read the rest because it's there's a lot in here that's really really powerful uh, to sort of explore on your own but believe it or not uh, the rise of knights and chivalry from which coats of arms are ultimately derived originated with uh, Charlemagne in the early 9th century so that's kind of how far back this sort of system works uh, which is, you know, in the 800s AD, right? Um, and being the father of Europe, it was our Frankish King Charlemagne, who, being named Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD, endeavored to introduce a few of the military advancements he had seen in the Roman Empire to his own people in Western Europe. So learning about King Charlemagne and who he actually was was super, super important. And you see here a link to a, an, another article that I wrote and researched, and this is kind of cool, I'll show you a preview of it, is how the sword of Charlemagne ended up in Italy. <laughs> so this is kind of a cool uh, research thing I did that spun out of a book I read. And you can see here a picture of uh, Joyeuse, which is Charlemagne's sword here, but um, it's kind of details how uh, Charlemagne's sword ended up in Italy in the year 1495. 
and I like to say it will pommel you to the hilt. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> very briefly, the rise of the knightly class. So this is kind of how coats of arms came out, came out of the knightly class. Super, super simple. Um, and believe it or not, all of the flurry and fancy and intricacy that are now part of the design elements go, that go into a modern coat of arms, think back to the Jones example I gave you, all started with the horse. <laughs> and that is such a cool, neat connection. And that's because the horse created the knight. And knights created coats of arms via the lords whom they served and the livery, which is what they wore, on themselves. Yeah? And it was all very military back then. And it's important to remember this because the rise of coats of arms for surnames basically arose out of the need for kings in medieval Western Europe to be warrior kings, okay, in order to be considered successful. And at that period in time, uh, if you didn't fight for your turf, you got put out, okay? So if you're looking back to the 11th century or the 12th century and before that, um, the struggle was real between being a king in Western Europe, you literally had to fight for every scrap and inch of your territory. So knights and embattlements and all that became a very, very integral part of what it meant to be a king and queen in medieval Europe that period of time. Um, and I've given you a couple references to sort of discuss medieval English ruler shirt if you like to check those out there. And uh, you can see here, these are kind of a neat example of the knightly class. And if you look closely, you can begin to decipher coats of arms, the origin of coats of arms, because it's kind of all bedecked in symbology, if you will, because uh, you look at, say, this figure on the left, right, dressed in black and with a sword, and you can kind of decipher a little bit about the meaning of what maybe this knight stood for with this what is kind of closely represented as a Maltese cross, right? Not exactly quite, but um, compared to this armament, this uh, complete uh, shield here, I mean, this is kind of where the derivation of information might come from, right? You can see, first of all, this shield is quartered, right? That's the first thing your eye should be drawn to, quartered. And patterns are repeated on opposite sides of the shield, right? And the symbology of the lion, right for English nobility three lions right before and you can kind of tell the era right between the Plantagenets and the Normans who actually had uh, before the three lions there were two lions and then one lion right they sort of added on as as the evolution of those dynasties um, made their way from literally from France to to England and of course the very uh, powerful fleur de lis right which is the lily flower uh, the fleur de lis, sort of very, very French, obviously. Uh, but you can see these, and you can sort of decipher a little bit more knowing what heraldry represents, okay? And uh, what we're also going to talk about in the article, not me at this point in the video, but in the article I talk extensively about something called a sure coat, which is this piece of drapery over your armory, okay? Or your your, the physical protection part and this was an, an identifier okay because if you look at these guys right just kind of just focus on them right if you're on the battlefield like how could you tell who is who right how could you tell who your enemy was how could you tell who you know your leader was or not um, because everyone's face is covered right and their whole body is covered like how do you know who to attack how do you know who to defend right so uh, really coats of arms this is really the origin of it right there is just like making yourself known on the battlefield. What side do you represent, okay? And uh, so, again, I'm not gonna really cover this in so much detail. I'll just kind of leave you with this part and maybe jump down. Um, so, the, the important piece, piece of information right here though is, as the need for a royal house to protect itself in ever more elaborate ways increased, naturally refined a concomitant increase in the military class of people that we now know as knights. So knights carried forth this symbology on behalf of their overlords, right? And this, but this is kind of the cool part and why I want you to come back and read this because uh, originally, you know, we think of knights as, as these grand sort of uh, things of fantasies and movies, right? Uh, but they, originally they were servants, okay? And the Anglo-Saxon, uh, their uh, 
etymology of it, it, it was the term was knecht, or uh, a servant to the king, and were not of royal birth. Even before that, uh, original knights were hired mercenaries that rich families paid to do their bidding or wreak havoc on their enemies. And this was back in the Dark Ages, which is can go all the way back to about the fourth century. So it's a pretty long time ago, right before, way before the twelfth century, uh, when knights and armor started to really develop itself. So between the 4th and 11th or 12th century, that's quite a bit of time. So we see an evolution happening during that period of time. And really, honestly, back then, it was way too expensive in the Dark Ages to afford, afford your own standing army. <clears throat> Something we take for granted nowadays, every modern nation has its own standing army. Back then, you just hired mercenaries, basically, to do your bidding. Um, however, over time, as their service be became more valued and their relationships deepened with the royal families of the Middle Ages, which is a period a little later on, to whom their service was given, knights were granted, and this is very important, they were granted lands and titles. Okay, lands and titles. So once you got land, you became almost like a gentry class, right? You're going to see a rising class, and this is where the knights sort of eventually, eventually end up melding into the royal houses, right? And titles, once you grant lands, you, you are now a person, right? And titles, ooh, that means you can eventually join the aristocracy. And so these two phrases, this these two words here are very, very key uh, in connecting the origins of the knightly class and how coats of arms became not just symbols, but uh, genealogy, okay? And so I'll take you through the idea of chivalry the origins of chivalry because it's so super interwoven with who the knights were their ideals of what their job was became very very important so take you through the ideas of chivalry arms and heraldry okay these are two terms that get bandied about quite a bit informally how they however they have very very specific jobs that they funk that they term and uh, that they have these two words do in, in our, uh, well, let's just say our heraldic uh, lexicon, if you will. And so I take you to the difference of those, the semantics of the two different words and what they mean um, and how historians treat those terms and how we should treat those terms because of the formality of them when talking about coats of arms, especially for family names. And this will actually, whether you actually have a, a coat of arms granted to your family, in the past or are looking to just understand a little bit more about novelty coats of arms you know understanding the science of heraldry is it will help you and it's it makes you a more intelligent and knowing person and then talk about the practicality of armor um, and it was like the necessity of warriors to distinguish themselves from one another on the battlefield as I talked about and as I mentioned previously the importance of the sure coat Okay, you're probably like, what's a sure coat? Uh, and this is the importance of it uh, because it was something that uh, defined who a warrior was or what side that person was on and even the king uh, himself on the battlefield. But it was a garment worn here and you can see what a sure coat might look like. Okay, and they were the literal first coats of arms. And here's a little glimpse into what's going on in this part of the article that's very, very important. And, and this is not my words, this, the, this thought comes out of the uh, uh, medievalist books that I've read on, on the origin of coats of arms and things, but it was literally, right, think about it, it's a sure coat, and we're talking about coats of arms, right, coat exists in both of those terms, and it was literally where the term coat of arms came from, the sure coat, and it was such an integral and central component of the evolution of heraldry as a larger sort of, again, science. So these are what authors and historians themselves really, really point towards. And um, of course, I've given you guys uh, a few quotes to sort of, uh, you know, let you know exactly where coats of arms come from. So this is kind of interesting from research and really just sort of pointing back to the authors and saying, yeah, these are the guys saying it. And this is very, very important. And talk about Sure coats, um, the Bayou Tapestry, if you don't know what that is, you can read about it here. It's very, very 
It's about the Battle of Hastings, 1066, and it's a tapestry that was woven to tell the story of it. Okay, and so cover a little bit about that. Uh, the Crusades and feudalism, which is a very, very uh, kind of cool part about how <clears throat> the knightly class developed. And when we're talking about knightly class, of course, we're talking about coats of arms, right, and families. And talk about the Chanson de Geste, which are the uh, songs of deeds. And the original was the Song of Roland, which is actually the Song of Charlemagne. And uh, <clears throat> talks about the importance of music and talking about singing songs of deeds of the warriors of old and telling those stories in royal court. So uh, library and heraldry all became sort of this part of like... Uh, you know, media that really was consumed back then um, in terms of how people told stories. So that's really, really neat as well. And heraldry becomes genealogy. So, so crucial right here. And this is where coats of arms and these designs, basically in a nutshell, become formalized. They become formalized and standardized. And then we have a college of arms that was created around those uh, functions of it, and now you be, be now you devote language to it as well, and the language is always taken from French for European coats of arms. And again, I talk about that in here. Colors like or for gold or azure for blue, and it when you describe a coat of arms in the college of arms, it really discusses it in terms of these. There's a very very systematic use of language um, that it's almost its own syntax that you use and, and I give you references to um, authors that um, talk about this if you want to read more and stuff and again well leave this is kind of important I don't want to skip over this but so because this is, the whole article is about can I use a coat of arms for my surname right and I said the answer is yes and no and I told you kind of the yes part and the no part, but literally the no part of my answer is taken from the College of Arms own FAQ page, okay? Because all coats of arms come from the College of Arms. And so I've even provided a link to their page um, from which I've taken the quote, and it literally tells you, do coats of arms belong to surnames? Answer, no. <laughs> Okay, so that's the, the definitive, an, definitive answer here. And um, there is no such thing as a coat of arms for a surname. And it really outlines exactly uh, why. And so, no. However, you know, I don't want to sort of leave you with this sort of maybe, you know, negative or dour point of view. Like, oh my gosh, man, I, I wanted to use this coat of arms I found online and I really don't feel like I can use it now, but so I want to leave you with something super, super positive um, in, in like encouraging people to do this. You, if you want to use a coat, novelty coat of arms for your family name, for research or for genealogy, or just sort of your own self edification, you know, I'm of the, of the opinion like, yeah, use it. It's fun. Why not? Okay. Um, and the practicality, I'm going to read this bold face quote right here, um, is that as long as you understand that there is no connection between a novelty coat of arms with your surname on it and it being a real coat of arms with historical implications, then you are okay. Go ahead and use it for fun if you want to. It's awesome, okay? With the rise of individuals like myself being inter interested in their European genealogy came a parallel increased uh, interest in patronymics, which is the stud origin and study of surnames. Uh, this interest spurred massive business opportunities, and these, these are where all these uh, codes of arms appear on the internet, right? Uh, massive business opportunities for companies to capitalize on the marketing of surname histories and selling the codes of arms for surnames, right? Because if you think about it in the real practical sense of the College of Arms, you don't sell these things, right? <laughs> you do not sell these things. These are not for sale. Uh, so this fantastic void in the market led to the creation of companies like House of Names, right? If you've done any research online, you just, you know, Googled 
surname histories or whatever, your house of names will come up, along with similar companies. And they've collectively compiled well over one million surname histories and so-called, and I say so-called, coats of arms for the unsus unsuspecting. And this is an example, if your last name is Collins, for example, it's a novelty coat of arms. It really doesn't tell you much. If, if you submitted this to the actual College of Arms, they'd laugh you off the block because it's just sort of very, very simple. And, but, um, you know, kind of going into how coats of arms work, you know, all of the sort of mechanics of how you would design one is also in this article. And uh, again, looking at examples of various designs and how kind of cool they look and why we get drawn into looking at that right if we're looking for our family name and we see that we're like ooh yeah that that's me that's cool right and of course you know the uh fleur de lis of course the lily flower and this is a stylization of the actual lily right which you see here and then this is how it actually evolved if you never knew that and the lion of course another another very very powerful uh heraldic piece and i have a separate um article devoted to heraldic lion positions and terminology right here on the Family History Foundation. So yeah, you may want to read that. And in conclusion, just kind of leaving you with, with this thought, and hopefully I think if you're watching this, you can connect to this for sure. I remember when I first started doing genealogy and became enamored with all of my newly found surnames. And I was just about shaking with excitement, thinking that I could have a coat of arms for my surname, right? And I literally was super, super excited by this. I downloaded high-res images and even paid a person who researched, quote-unquote, my family surname that I had met in a small curio shop outside of Seattle, right? <laughs> well, I soon found out that it was all for naught. Right, because these are novelty coat of arms. I didn't really understand the, the difference at that point, right? Or was it, right? Because although I now fully understand what these novelty coats of arms are, it, that does not diminish my excitement. Even today when talking about them or their origins, you know, as long as you know what they are and learn about the history of her heraldry to some degree, they are there to enjoy. If they inspire you to learn more about your family history and where your ancestral roots come from, take pride in your heritage. And that is awesome. So I think it's super cool. Enjoy them and go for it. So I hope that sort of helps. And thank you for reading this. Here's a list of the references you can get to um, when you read this article. But thank you for uh, going through this with me and thanks for tuning out tuning in to the Family History Foundation and you can like and subscribe if you like our content and have an amazing amazing day.